Good evening, my dears. I've been uh, fretting about this task that I've set you for your work uh, over spring break. It's not uh, easy uh, at the best of times. Um, uh, it's a longish book and uh, it's a French book. <laughs> of course, you're not expected to read it in French. Uh, but I hope you found uh, a version, uh, some organization called Global Grey eBooks. Grey is G R E Y. Global Grey Books eBooks uh, does a. Uh, um, it's just uh, uh, dangerous liaisons. Uh, dot dangerous hyphen liaisons. Uh, dot PDF. Um, and that's a. A pretty readable version. So, assuming you can get some of that read, assuming you find it interesting enough uh, to pursue, I've asked you also to check out the movie versions, uh, or at least one movie version, that you can find uh, on YouTube. I do this because one of the movies is uh, uh, extraordinarily brilliant at taking uh, scenes out of the book and dramatizing them. This is all down to the uh, genius of one person, Christopher Hampton, a uh, wonderful uh, uh, British uh, playwright um, and a screenwriter who had a great success at a very early age. He was still a coll at college uh, like you when uh, one of his plays found its way to the West End, as it were, the equivalent of Broadway. Uh, in, in London, and he became the youngest person uh, to have a play <laughs> in the West End. Uh, he said his ambition now is to also become the oldest person. That will be quite hard. Uh, George Bernard Shaw uh, who wrote a play at the age of 93, as far as I know, the oldest, <laughs> the oldest practicing playwright of any uh, stature at all, uh, writing at that extreme old age. So uh, Christopher wrote a stage play uh, based on uh, Dangerous Liaisons, and that had quite, a, quite an influence on the film uh, script that he eventually wrote. And it, it, you'll see that the book is an epistolary novel. It's all done in letters, with the, with the result that the two main contestants, the two uh, uh, lovers, former lovers, who are challenging each other uh, to do some outrageous deed, to perform some outrageous seduction which would render them worthy of the other and worthy of another night together. These two characters, the Marquise de, de Merteuil and the Vicomte, the Viscount of Valmont, never meet. They never meet. They only write letters to each other. This is extraordinary because in the epistolary novel, it's perfectly possible, and indeed usual, uh, for characters to meet and write each other letters about that. Like that, you know, when you were here for tea, you behaved disgracefully. But uh, in fact, there is no such encounter even referred to. These two remarkable monsters uh, of manipulation and malice and passion. Um, never actually meet in the course of the novel, although the meeting is precisely what the Viscount is jumping over hoops for, hoops and, and jumps that are uh, imposed on him uh, by the Marquise. Now, the question arises uh, also uh, very quickly, at least in my mind, of why should we care, even if we're not disgusted by the uh, the cruelty that is displayed uh, by these uh, beautiful rich people, uh, would we not ask ourselves whether we care about the doings of the rich? One of the aspects of the book is that uh, none of the characters have to actually earn their living. <laughs> they don't actually have to be doing anything. So why do we care? Why would we care? Why would I ask you to care uh, about the doings of the super rich. I don't much care about the doings of the super rich today, and so I shouldn't be caring too much about it uh, in the 1780s when this book was written. However, um, 
as a work of literature, this has endured, not because it's merely about the, the very rich, but because it explores uh, to the nth degree, all the way, uh, the perversity of our desires. We all, in principle at any rate, would like to be rich. We would like not to have to get up in the morning and work. And so what would we, what would we do with our heart's desire? Um, uh, would we live continent lives, um, kind to our friends? Um, would we uh, control, restrict uh, our our lusts and our longings? Would we not actually have uh, 25 or 250 cars in a huge garage because we are super rich, we do what we like? Um, and what would we do with our passions? So. There is in this novel, I think, a real exploration of what happens when you take uh, the brakes off of human life, uh, when you give people inordinate power and inordinate riches, and that's uh, uh, the story here. So it's a, a mirror, I think, is, and that's its importance as a, as a book. It's a mirror held up to uh, the incontinence of our love and our lust for power over others and the dangerous paths it leads us down. And I think that's strangely fascinating. The, the, uh, the question is, uh, how long are these people going to survive on this terrifying tightrope in which we're f they're fighting uh, an extraordinary duel of love? I have uh, tried to incline you in uh, what I've said previously about the novel also to see uh, the, the importance of there having been love between uh, the terrible Marquise and the terrible uh, Vicomte de Valmont. Uh, there was love, uh, and uh, I, I feel that m most adaptations of the book and most readings of the book would rather see uh, two uh, brutal, cynical, exploiting uh, tyrants uh, of love rather than see uh, how uh, lovers like them are so afraid of surrendering to their own passion, they're making themselves vulnerable, the great fear, uh, that in order to avoid that awful moment of surrender, they, con they continue to um, uh, defer it by requiring more uh, sacrifices from their partner so as to avoid the moment the terrible moment of surrender. And I think in many ways for me, the book can be read as a, a tender account of how love scares the wits out of us. Not everybody feels like that, but an enormous number of people do. And I feel that's the subject of this book. Um, what is beautiful about the film I recommend to you, the film version, the Christopher Hampton screenplay, directed by uh, Stephen Frears, uh, usually thought of as the John Malkovich version because it features him as uh, uh, Valmont, uh, is that uh, two things happened that made this film better than any of the many, many other films that have been made uh, uh, of, this, uh, of this book. It's irresistible. Everybody wants to play a, a demon seductor, a demon seductress. Uh, what makes this film um, uh, easily the best uh, are two things. The first is is uh, Hampton's extraordinary deftness in uh, transforming the material, creating scenes that are not in the book, taking the book and truly running with it not only uh, into a movie but into into narrative and with uh, events that don't happen in the book but should certainly for a film. It's it's a screenplay of, of sublime genius, and the director Stephen Frears. Uh, who I've known all my life, at least since I was 18, um, made a very important decision uh, which makes, gives the film its power. Uh, he's not necessarily the most brilliant director, but he noticed something about a week in uh, as what's called the dailies or the rushes came in and they, sh they looked at what had already been filmed and he saw, quite rightly, that the only things that really worked were the close-ups. The film was really, was really only working when you were right in on, on faces, rather than backed off and trying to create a frou-frou world of the 18th century with its powdered wigs and costumes and all the rest. 
So he made the very wise decision to close in on all of them. And they are very, uh, very lovely. You have the Michelle Pfeiffer giving a wonderful performance, and she is there in all her beauty, the absolute height of her beauty. And we have Uma Thurman. Uh, it's, it, they're really gorgeous. Um, uh, Malkovich is not gorgeous. Arguably, uh, uh, Glenn Close, who plays uh, the Marquise, is not gorgeous. But she is an actress of supreme subtlety, and her performance is imposing. Um, by its gleaming uh, detail. It's quite wonderful. Malkovich uh, is ridiculous as a famous seducer. Utterly absurd. But my wife was very keen when I was <laughs> saying this to her to say, yeah, but he's really sexy. I mean, he looks like a, I don't know, a, a lizard of some kind, some strange creature. Not a beautiful human, but my goodness, uh, he does exude uh, a charm and sexuality. He's absurd in the 18th century because he doesn't know how to use his body uh, to, uh, as they did then very formally, to bow, uh, to stand in a certain way. He slouches around as if he was imported yesterday from the 20th century and everybody else is holding themselves, their body, in a rather appropriate fashion. Malkovich can't do that. It doesn't matter. Indeed, perhaps the whole charm of the film is that he doesn't belong in that world. And yet he brings carelessly and forcefully to it uh, his own extraordinary charm and uh, makes the film magnetic and fascinating. You could also take a look at uh, someone who I regard as the greatest actor of the, of the 20th century, Gérard Philippe, French actor who played classical uh, uh, theatre and movies and uh, was peerless until his ridiculously early death uh, at 36. Um, that year, or rather the year after, I was uh, went to Paris having finished high school and stayed without, I, I barely knew this, I barely knew what it meant. Uh, my mother had uh, rented uh, Gérard Philippe's apartment, he was now dead, but uh, I, I lived there for the whole summer. Um, and I look back on it with a, a terrible frisson uh, of awe because he was the greatest. He was, he was just fantastic. And you can see him uh, uh, with uh, the great Jeanne Moreau in the version that Roger Vadim uh, uh, filmed. See some clips of it to get a feel for it. There are clips of other versions too, if you like. Really don't bother with the Miloš Forman version called Valmont which was being made at the same time. Foreman decided he was going to make a film uh, of uh, Les Liaisons just after uh, Frears & Co. had decided that too. So there was a terrible race to uh, get the films out. Uh, Frears' version is an absolutely compelling film. Uh, uh, Foreman's is a disaster. He's a great director, he, he, but he tried to let, make a lot of set pieces out of it. Um, and uh, he misunderstood where the attraction was in the film uh, and, uh, and completely screwed it up. It's, it's very interesting. Film is very difficult. Film is very surprising. <laughs> but I'm asking you to take a look at it in relation to this book because it may be uh, a slightly easier way in to what is quite a difficult and quite a long book. Uh, but uh, Hampton and Frears make a fascinating job of it and uh, it, it doesn't transport you to the 18th century so much as transport you to these beautiful and extraordinary and compelling faces. And there's something interesting about the fact that the central two characters are not the most beautiful. In fact, they're kind of verging on ugly. <laughs> Both Glenn Close in, is certainly in, in, in this movie and Malkovich, uh, uh, whereas all those around them are exemplary, gorgeous beauties, and it is the, the two central monsters, the ugly ones, who are plucking these blossoms and challenging each other to pluck yet another. And that seems to fit strangely. Maybe that's part of the odd magic of Dangerous Liaisons, the movie, which I recommend to you. Um, so uh, I hope you find uh, some thoughts uh, to have about this. I shall certainly be asking you what conclusions you came to uh, about uh, the movie and uh, more than that uh, I hope you're 
uh, having some kind of a break. I, I, I think I shall want to ask you on Monday, under these circumstances, is there such a thing as a break, as actual spring break? Maybe there isn't anyway most of the time. It's just a, a name, just a word. But I, I hope somehow it's a little more than that. And I wish you all the very best. And I look forward very much to seeing you again. So uh, I will do that next Monday. Bye-bye all.